Cluster strike arriving. What is up guys? Welcome back to another GeekoArt video. In this video, I'm going to be building an awesome white themed gaming PC build for 2022. Perfect for maxing out your favorite titles at 1440p and beyond. Featuring one of the new 12th gen i5 CPUs, an RTX 3070 Ti, and one of Corsair's brand new case and fan combos that combines the best of airflow with the best of RGB. Let's do this. Now I'm gonna kick today's build off by taking a look at a few of the core components first. And by that, I mean the motherboard, the CPU, the memory or the RAM, and of course, our NVMe Gem 4 storage. And why not kick off with the storage? Samsung very kindly sent out their 980 Pro and helped make today's video possible. A Gem 4 drive with speeds in the region of seven gigabytes a second. Perfect next generation storage tech to match up with our next gen memory tech too. Made up of Corsair's Vengeance DDR5, a 5200 megahertz kit of the latest super fast DDR5 memory. All of these components will be installed upon the MSI MPG Z 690 Force Gaming Wi-Fi motherboard, a name that takes a bit of thinking about. Now this is a sort of a silver slash white themed board, something we don't see much of with Z690, so it's nice to see MSI doing something just a little bit different. To tell you the truth, this board's got all the features we could want to get a really smooth, streamlined experience from our 12th gen Intel CPU. Everything from overclocking support for the CPU and memory, to PCI 5, SSD Gen 4, and two and a half gigabit Ethernet on the rear panel. These boards are more expensive than the B660 counterparts, which new for Intel actually supports CPU overclocking too. But when you go in this high end, when you go in for something like a 3070 Ti, honestly, the extra hundred dollars or so that you'll pay for the motherboard makes a lot of sense in my opinion. One thing we'll also be doing is we'll be installing the SSD at this stage, rounding off the four components we always start our high end builds off with. This is the Samsung SS. This is the Samsung SSD 980 Pro, one of the fastest Gen 4 NVMe drives on the market. This is like the RTX 3080 equivalent in the SSD world. And with high-end GPUs nowadays, it's important you get a powerful, speedy SSD, as storage can become a bottleneck. If your GPU and system as a whole can't read the texture files and some of the data from your game's location save, you can actually see yourself suffering in the frame rate department. And trust me, that is the last thing you want to be happening. This motherboard also includes one of these new tallest NVMe installation processes, something I'm not a huge fan of with any of the vendors so far. But in this case, it seems to have worked fairly flawlessly. So maybe I'm wrong on that one and I just don't like change. I don't like innovation. I don't like the way the world is moving. Which is a shame, but it won't stop me moving on to the case for this build. A bit of a weird choice. This case is actually a bit of a peculiar choice because it's Corsair's 4000D in white. Sounds okay so far, but crammed with their QL fans. This is available in a bundle exclusively on the Corsair web store, which we'll be linking to in future in the descriptions of our videos. They are affiliate links, so just a bit of a disclaimer for you there. Opening the box up, I'm excited to see what Corsair have done here. I always said that it was weird that the airflow case came with less fans than the non-airflow case when this series first launched, so it's good to see those concerns addressed here. By the looks of things, Corsair haven't just added some fans and been done with it. This is all now completely white, where before it had these weird kind of grey accents. So Corsair, you're winning me over. What we do need to do though, is we need to lay the case down flat on our table. We're going to remove the thumb screws from the tempered glass side panel, or rather loosen and unfasten them, as that will make installing the motherboard. The next step, if I can get in the thing, a lot, lot easier indeed. That is best demonstrated by actually going ahead and popping the motherboard in itself. Bit of a tight squeeze, but it will slot in nicely. Corsair's center standoff is raised, which holds the motherboard in place, stop it from falling anywhere, and then we can fasten it down in the other remaining three, four, five, six, seven, eight screw holes. The ninth middle standoff, as I say, is blocked out. It will just hold the board in place while you do the next stage. The next stage of the build is to install the cooler. Now, once again, we've tied it in with the white theme of this build. Our poor RAM is looking a bit of an odd one out over in our case, but this radiator is definitely not, and it's a much bigger bigger element of the build than the memory, and will make a big difference aesthetically. This right here is Corsair's H1 
H150i Elite Capellix. It's a cooler that does a great job of keeping any chip nice and frosty, but will also fit in the front of the case very nicely. Plus, the addition of some more Corsair RGB fans means either we can load the top of the case up with a bit more exhaust, though they're not QL, so they won't perfectly match, or we could go for a push-pull config. On the proviso, the GPU wasn't too long. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to hedge my bets, keep the fans to one side for now, and install them at the end. Once the card's in, once everything's in place, and we'll know a little bit more then where we stand with everything. For now, we're going to remove the front panel of the case. I forgot what it was called then. And we're going to take the existing fans out, then reinstall the existing fans with these much longer screws. Once that's done, the radiator's in, and we can install the water block. In order to install the cooler, you need to pop these metal brackets on the cooler itself, stick your back plate through the rear of the motherboard, and then add on these female, no, these male to male posts. That's where you've got a screw thread on either side. Once you've done that, you can whack the water block on itself and finish it off with these four thumb screws. Tighten them up with a screwdriver. They do have a little Phillips head cut out on them to make sure your water block is nice and secure. And once you've done that, you can go ahead and move on to the famous GPU. Now for this build, I really, really wanted a white graphics card. And something like MSI Supreme is a close bet, but not quite close enough. Unfortunately, I haven't got any. And like you guys, I couldn't get any. So I had to make do with what we had. This right here is a Founders Edition 3070 Ti. I figured it was more sleek and less garishly out of scheme than some of the other options on the market. I wouldn't recommend spray painting this as I don't have the budget as some of those other larger PC burning channels out there. But I think nevertheless, it should still look pretty good. Plus, by the looks of things, it will allow us to put a push-pull fan config at least on the top two slots of the radiator. So before before I actually go ahead and finalize the GPU installation, I'm going to whack the fans in here first and then go ahead and pop the GPU in afterwards. That's because if the GPU is already in, trying to get a screwdriver in place is just not going to end very well. So fans, then graphics card, which we can easily do by taking out the rear PCI covers, slotting the card into place and clicking everything down nicely so it doesn't go anywhere. And then once that's done, we can wrap things up with the last component on the list, the power supply. For a build like this, 750, 850 watts is going to work well. Preferably, you want something fully modular, like this one, with a decent 80 plus certification. What helps with this power supply as well is that our cables are white, which matches the theme of the build. Now, I wanted to recommend this unit, A, because it's white and it fits with the theme, but also because if you didn't want to spend the extra cash on fancy sleeve braided cables, you don't have have to, as the ones that come included will work more than fine. We're going to plug in cables for the motherboard, CPU, GPU, and then a SATA cable that we're going to use for our fans and all the RGB in the case. And then we can pop the power supply in. It is RGB, so maybe we'll pop it fan up and then it will create a nice little glow below the graphics card. And with that, we're basically done. So much so we can actually boot the system up for the first time and check out the performance numbers in just a moment. But before any of that, it's time to see how good it looks when it's all powered on in an epic Gigawatt glam montage. I'll see you in a sec, but first, roll that montage. You are the Apex Champion. Awesome stuff. Now we've seen how good this awesome all white system looks and it's all powered up. That's a lot of A's. It's time to check out if the performance numbers match up equally. We tested out a range of titles at 1440p high settings pretty much across the board. And we're going to kick things off by taking a closer look at GTA 5. A slightly older title, but still a great test of a system's overall performance. Here we managed to pull in over 140 frames per second when testing out using the game's inbuilt benchmark mode. With strong 90 and 99th percentiles tested with both MSI Afterburners Reva Tuner and NVIDIA FrameView. It was a similarly positive story in Apex Legends, where we managed to achieve once again over 140 FPS. 149 to be precise. 130 and 112 for the 90 and 99th percentiles rounded off a suite of good numbers, with the game looking visually pretty stunning. Moving on to the Call of Duties next up, COD Warzone first off. We got 125 frames per second on average. The game here at 1440p looking absolutely lovely, while Call of Duties Vanguard achieved 110 frames per second. 
All of our COD testing and all of our game testing for that fact was done with DLSS enabled wherever applicable and where it was supported by the title in question. 99 and 86 for the 90 and 99th percentiles rounded off at a pretty great suite of numbers too. Moving on to Battlefield 2042, once again the numbers were pretty good. 90 frames per second on average with DLSS enabled at 1440p high settings. Remember of course, if you want that extra frame rate you can tune down to 1080p and that will really push your numbers up by about 25-30%. But for us today, 1440p just makes the most sense of the resolution. Next up is Halo Infinite, a game where we tested at 1440p once again and managed to pull in 111 frames per second on average. All the ones is a really satisfying number. 97 and 84 show consistent frame rates throughout as well, something that's really, really important. The penultimate title we'll be testing out before we dive into Fortnite, the last game on the list today, is Forza's Horizon 5. Here we managed to achieve 81 frames per second when tested in the in-game benchmark mode. This title is a load more difficult to run than the previous FH3 and 4, and by a good margin. Nevertheless, 81 frames a second in a racing game is a really, really solid result, and I was pleased with how Forza performed. Finally, to wrap things up, we tested out Fortnite at 1080p competitive settings. Once again, the numbers were really solid, just shy of 250 frames per second to be precise. To get 248 frames on average is insane. We did tune all the settings down to low and set the render distance to far to help us achieve these numbers. But nevertheless, they're figures I'm really pleased with. 250 FPS is not to be complained at in Fortnite. And on that note, that pretty much wraps it up for the video today. If you did enjoy it, make sure to smash that like button, get subscribed. Thanks for tuning in. And as always, we'll see you in the next one.